I'm Daniel, and this is EDH TV. Welcome to another Deck Tech video. Today I'm presenting you one of my EDH builds for Yarrick, the Desecrated. This is an almost optimized control deck based on flickering permanence. Its power level it's probably around 7 on a scale of 1 to 10, because Yarrick doesn't fit very well in this kind of deck, in my opinion. Its ability works definitively better in a combo deck but, this time, we don't have infinite combos here. Kinda. I mean, there is one, since in Yarrick it's easier to have combos than not. But the deck is almost completely based on value. I promise. This deck is not meant to be played in a CEDH pod and it's simply the list I'm playing in real life. So, it's built with the cards I own, which are many but not all. It doesn't want to be an advice on what you have to play. It's just an exposition and analysis of what I have chosen to play. Before start, I remind you that in description you can find the Archidec link for this list and for another one completely based on combos. In addition, English is not my mother tongue. That's why I'm using a text-to-speech software. I'll try to answer to every comment at my best, and I'll read all of them for sure. Nevertheless, I apologize if my knowledge will seem rough sometimes. Yarrick the Desecrated is a 3-5 elemental horror for two colorless, a blue, a black and a green. It has death touch and lifelink. In addition, it has an ability. If a permanent entering the battlefield causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. So, we play a large number of ETB effects that will help us control the game, slowing down our opponents until it's time to try to win the game. Let's start with the lands. Very quickly. We play 34 lands, 30 of which are dedicated to mana production and fixing. First of all our Rainbow Lands, Command Tower, Mana Confluence and City of Brass. And Forbidden Orchard, Exotic Orchard and Reflecting Pool. We play 5 Fetch Lands. Polluted Delta, Misty Rainforest, Verdant Catacombs, Flooded Strand and Prismatic Vista. And we play the 3 Shock Lands. Watery Grave, Breeding Pool and Overgrown Tomb. Then we have the 3 Pain Lands. Underground River, Yavamaya Coast and Lanawar Wastes. Then we have Morphic Pool, because it's a dual land that always enters the battlefield untapped. Cavern of Souls, because we hate to have our commander countered. And Ancient Tomb, because it's ramp. Then we play Gaia's Cradle, because it's so powerful. And since we're playing 34 creatures we can squeeze a huge amount of value out of this land. Finally, we play 9 snow-covered basic lands. 4 islands, 4 forests and a single swamp. We play 6 Mana Rocks in the deck. Mana Crypt, Sol Ring and Arcane Signet are pretty obvious inclusions. Then we have Felwar Stone, which, considering our colors, is often a second Arcane Signet. And Simic Signet and Talisman of Creativity, because blue and green represent more than 80% of our mana costs. Then we have Nature's Lore, because it allows us to search for an untapped land for only 2 mana. And, finally, we play Lotus Cobra. In this version of the deck it's not as performing as in the combo version, but it's still an excellent source of value. With Yarrick in play, triggering twice, each land we play gives us 3 mana that turn. In this deck we draw a ton of cards, but the best drawing engines are always the same. Surprise surprise, Rhystic Study and Sylvan Library. These are our only drawing effects that can't be doubled by Yarrick. Then we play 7 cards with an ETB trigger to draw us cards. Baleful Strix which, in addition, also has Flying and Death Touch. Ice Fang Kotal has Flash and Flying. But it only has Death Touch if we control at least 3 snow-covered lands. Elvish Visionary it's just a stupid 1-1 with no additional abilities. It's been here since I built the deck but, probably, I should take it off for some more performing effect. Coiling Oracle it's also a 1-1 with no abilities and we also have to reveal the card we draw. But, if it's a land, we can put it into play. Nonetheless, this creature it's also easily replaceable. Then we have Risen Reef. This is very interesting, because it triggers when it comes into play and also when we play our commander or one of our four other elementals. Then again, Seagate Oracle. This is not only card draw, but also a little of card selection, since we can chose one of the top two cards. Finally, Moldrifter. We can cast it for its evoke cost and, if Yarrick is on the battlefield, we'll draw 4 cards for only 3 mana. Then we have 2 effects that draws us cards when other permanents enter the battlefield. 
Guardian project triggers when a creature enters the battlefield under our control. While Sire of Stagnation triggers when a land enter the battlefield under an opponent's control, drawing us two cards and also exiling the top two cards of our opponent's library. Since we have a lot of drawing effects I play Reliquary Tower, because I don't like to discard my cards. As I've said, there are a couple of cards I'm considering to replace, and there are plenty of good options, of course. Trying Regal Force in the deck I've found myself drawing 10 or more cards. But, honestly, even if it's amazing, this card almost completely consumes our mana. So, we tap out, cast Regal Force and then, usually, we pass the turn and discard half of the cards we have drawn. I'm not saying it's a bad card, though. But I preferred to exclude it considering the 7 CMC and triple specific cost. Soul of the Harvest is another good but expensive card. But often it's killed even before we draw a single card. And, even when it survives, it's hard to justify spending 6 mana for this effect on a non-combo build. In the combo version of the deck, with Aloran and infinite mana generators, with this card we can draw our entire deck, but here is not as much abusable. It's a little slow, actually. Consecrated Sphinx is probably the card I will add. Even if its effect cannot be doubled, this card is always totally worth the inclusion in every blue deck, and easily pays for the 6 CMC expense with a single table rotation. It's so powerful. As for tutors we obviously play Demonic Tutor and Vampiric Tutor. Then, at the moment, I'm still play Chord of Calling, but I'm seriously thinking of replacing it, because of the triple green cost. It's an hard choice though, because it's an instant speed tutor whose cost can be discounted thanks to Convoke, and it puts the target directly on the battlefield. Although the cost is sometimes difficult to pay, the effect is amazing. Then, Fierce Empath. This elf it's here because we have some amazing targets for it, and with Yarrick in play we can tutor two creatures instead of one. Finally, Crop Rotation, our instant speed tutor for Gaia's Cradle. I must admit that Yarrick is a commander on which is easy to build, given the number of strong cards we can insert and take value from. But, at the same time, we are forced to cut some of them simply because we don't have enough space in the deck. Cards like Spellseeker, Rune Scarred Demon or also Wood Elves, just to name a few, can give us big big value. But we don't have enough space to include them all in the deck. Since ours is a control build, we must play permissions in the deck. Force of Will, Pact of Negation and Fierce Guardianship are amazing counterspells we can play for free. While Mana Drain, Swan Song, Counterspell and Delay are not free but still great. Finally, we play Venser, Shaper Savon. This creature is very interesting since as a remand on a stick, but also can bounce one of our permanents with an ETB to our hand for further value. We also play a few instant removals. First, Cyclonic Rift, because we are in blue. Then Assassin's Trophy, best spot removal of the game, and Beast Within. These two spells are here for emergency situations, for example to remove annoying permanents like Humility, Torpor Orb or Hushbringer. If some of these permanents enters the battlefield we are almost completely shut down, and cannot rely on the ETB abilities of our creatures to remove them. But we also play removals specifically calibrated on our commander, of course. Shriek Ma and Ravenous Chupacabra are creature removals. Reclamation Sage can take care of artifact and enchantments. And Massacre Worm is a kind of board wipe that also damages our opponents. Against token decks this card is awesome. Finally, we play Bojuka Bog. Graveyards in Commander are a thing, and we really like to remove them if we play against commanders like Muldrotha, Murin or Tassigur. Even better if we do it at instant speed using crop rotation. There are three cards that I consider highly underplayed in the other Yarrick lists I have seen. Cards that I play, and that always give me big satisfactions when I play this deck. These are Rishidan Cutpurse, Rishidan Footpad and Rishidan Brigand. When they come into play, each opponent sacrifice a permanent unless he or she pays, respectively one, two or three colorless mana. Of course, if Yarrick is on the battlefield, the ETB ability triggers twice. I can already tell you that we have various ways to flicker these three creatures, imposing a constant sacrifice engine on our opponents that will make us, in a few turns, obtain an advantage that could become unsustainable and overwhelming. In addition we also play Oath of Liliana, but this legendary enchantment only forces our opponents to sacrifice creatures. 
we play two creatures that allows us to bounce any creature on the table. Ether Adept and Man O War. Then we play Shrieking Drake, just in case we want to bounce one of our creatures for more value. Finally we play Dream Stalker, which allows us to bounce one of our permanents. This creature is also one of the two parts of our only infinite combo in the deck, as we'll see later. Notice that all these four creatures can bounce themselves back to our hand if we have Yerik in play. So, it's pretty easy to get value. Play, for example, Dream Stalker. Bounce it back with his own ability, and bounce, for example, one of our Rishidan sack effects. Our opponents won't appreciate this. Then we play Cloudstone Curio, which reads. Whenever a non-artifact permanent enters the battlefield under your control, you may return another permanent you control that shares a permanent type with it to its owner's hand. It's easy as this. Play a creature, get the value of the ETB trigger, bounce back to your hand another creature. Rinse and repeat. Finally, Teamer Sabertooth. For one and a green you may return another creature you control to its owner's hand. If you do, Teamer Sabertooth gains indestructible until end of turn. Now, the indestructible part is not so interesting, but for 2 mana we can bounce back a creature to our hand. So, Teamer Sabertooth is another value engine. One of the best things we can do with our creatures is flickering them. So, Ghostly Flicker and Displace are exactly the cards we need. For just 3 mana, we can chose 2 of our creatures and get more value from them. And, of course, there are interesting tricks we can do with this 2 instance. Then, Deadeye Navigator. Should I say more? This creature is simply amazing. Pay 2 mana, flicker a creature, get value. Do it again, and again, and again. If you compare Deadeye Navigator with Rishidan Brigand, for example, it's hard to think our opponents won't scoop. Finally, Thassa, Deep Dwelling and Conjurer's Closet. Both this card can flicker one of our value engines at the beginning of our end step. You can see how bounce and flicker our creatures as the core of the deck, and the key to victory. Eternal Witness is an obvious choice for this deck, since we can return to our hand two cards from our graveyard, thanks to Yerik. And, similarly, Archaeomancer can return two instant or sorcery spells. We have an amazing synergy between these two cards and Ghostly Flicker or Displace. For example, we can cast Displace, targeting Archaeomancer and another creature. So we get the value of that creature ETB and, in addition, Archaeomancer can return the barely casted Displace back to our hand. Finally, we play Volrath's Stronghold because it's a repeatable recursion for our creatures on a land, which is amazing. We play three cards which give us the opportunity to steal permanents from our opponents. Agent of Treachery can steal two permanents with Yerik in play, and we don't lose them even if the agent leaves the battlefield. Treachery is the second part of our infinite mana combo, together with Dream Stalker. Even if we don't play it for the combo, which I recommend with this specific deck build, it's still amazing to steal an opponent creature and also gain 5 mana. Finally Royal Elemental. Every time a land enters the battlefield we can gain control of a creature. Unluckily we'll have to return them all in case Royal Elemental leaves the battlefield. Now, we can do without these three effects, which are quite expensive in terms of CMC. We can rely on the usual Peregrine Drake, Cloud of Fairies and Palancron, introducing the typical package of creatures necessary to go infinite with mana. But since the goal was to focus only on value, I preferred to exclude these untapped land effects, leaving them for the combo build. But, probably, if you want to low the mana curve, the best option is to replace these three cards with a few protections for our commander. Cards like Swiftfoot Boots or Lightning Greaves, for example, can help us a lot to keep Yerik in play. As I've said, this is a control shell, not a landfall one. But, of course, there are some landfall cards that we can't ignore. Field of the Dead rewards us with two zombies if we have Yerik onto the battlefield, and we play a land while we have at least another six different lands in play. Which is not difficult to achieve. Another good card is Taddy Ova, Benthic Druid. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under our control we can gain 2 life and draw 2 cards, if we control Yerik. Then, Avenger of Zendikar. When it enters the battlefield, we create a 0-1 green plant creature token for each land we control. Then, whenever a land enters the battlefield under our control, we may put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on each plant creature we control. And both this are triggered abilities that we can double with our commander. 
Finally, rampaging ballots, that create 4-4 green beasts every time we play a land. Two of them, if we control Yarrick. We have two main win conditions. The first one is Craterhoof Behemoth. This 5-5 hasty beast is always good when we talk about green creatures. I know that a lot of people think it's a boring win condition, and I can agree, but this is probably the best possible deck in which to play this beefy creature. And the second win con is Grey Merchant of Asphodel. But, in this case, it's not so easy. We don't have many black permanents, and we may have to flicker Gary multiple times to complete our mission and win the game. Our last card, marked as good stuff, is Panharmonicon. It's an artifact that doubles the ETB triggers of our permanents. Yes, it's a second copy of Yerik, substantially. And that's the deck. To recap, it's a control deck based on pure value and ETB triggers. The deck is very fun to play, with a lot of shenanigans and interesting interactions. However, the deck relies heavily on the commander, and does not always manage to defend him adequately. Since it tends to attract a lot of attention and hate, and some opponents may get annoyed and salty for some of our interactions, we must be careful before spread death and destruction between our opponent's creatures. I hope you have enjoyed this deck tech. If you like what I'm doing, and you want to help the channel, please, click the thumb to like the video, share it, subscribe or leave a comment. Thank you everyone. I'm Daniel, this is EDH TV, and I really hope to see you next time.